into our final workshop for the morning. And uh, we're happy to have with us uh, colleague Brooke, uh, basically state coordinator for the, I hope I got that right, Carly, for the Washington Against Nuclear Weapons um, organization uh, or campaign. And then Kit, Kit Burns, who's also uh, works uh, is associated with them. So Carly and uh, Kit, uh, welcome and uh, go for it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, really honored to present alongside the other presenters and thank you to the Fellowship of Reconciliation for having us. Um, I'm gonna share a presentation and then Kit and I will, will co-present. So just give me one second to get that up. Let's see. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, we just like to start by introducing ourselves in our workshop. Um, the, the workshop we're about to begin is called Nuclear Weapons, Building an Interconnected Movement. Um, so uh, I work with Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility and Kit is a member also of our task force. Um, yeah, and I just unmuted you, Kit. Do you want to um, introduce WPSR? Yeah, my name is Kit Burns. I am an architect in Tacoma, but I've been on the Washington uh, the WPSR tax force for the last number of years, actually. So, great. And Washington Against Nuclear Weapons is our statewide coalition, of which um, FOR is a member. Um, we'd like to invite more people to join um, as we work in the state to build resistance to the presence of of nuclear weapons and work to prevent their use. Um, we're for the total abolition of these weapons, um, particularly in one of the countries that has more than almost any other country in the world. Um, so why am I starting this presentation with this picture? I don't know if anyone can put in the chat what this might be a picture of. Usually when you talk about nuclear weapons, you might see a mushroom cloud, you might see a missile, you might see something of that nature, but does anyone have an idea what this is a picture of? So this is a picture of the evacuation of um, one of the islands in the Marshall Islands during the nuclear testing that happened um, during the Cold War, um, during the 67 nuclear weapons that were detonated off the coast of a tiny Pacific atoll. Um, the people were, were told that they were doing this for the good of mankind and for um, uh, and the US military wanted to test these weapons in their waters um, in order to see what they could do and how much destruction they would cause. Um, so we're talking here about um, the story of many communities, many peoples, whose lives have been forever changed and damaged um, by these horrible weapons of mass destruction. Um, and so for us, it's really important as a health organization to always center the people who are most impacted, to center the people um, who by no fault of their own live with the daily effects of these weapons, not just to talk about the arsenals um, and the issues of, of future weapons. So to get us started, um, these will be our objectives today. We'll talk about how nuclear weapons policy is connected to social, economic, and racial justice. And we'll also address um, the people, land, and labor across Washington that have been uniquely affected um, by nuclear issues and how we can build a broader anti-nuclear weapons movement here in the Pacific Northwest in solidarity with the peoples around the world who are impacted. Uh, by these weapons. So I'm going to hand it off to Kit, who will share a little bit about the background of nuclear weapons in the United States, um, including the, the Cold War arms race, treaties, broken promises, neglect, and touch on resistance. And then I'll zoom in to Washington State.
to, to talk about that legacy. So Kit, go ahead and take it away from here. So am I on or you just hear yep. my voice? You're on. Okay. Looking at the nuclear arms treaties, as if you've been paying attention, and I, I know you have been, um, a number of these treaties have been, um, are being in the process of being abandoned. Not only the one with uh, Iran, which was very unfortunate, but starting in 2002, George Bush pulled the U.S. out of the anti-ballistic uh, missile treaty. That was in 2002. And so these uh, treaties that we've been making to reduce and limit the use of nuclear weapons and limit the stockpiles are now being abandoned. And the United States is actually taking the lead. Uh, we're actually the one dismantling these treaties. Uh, the most recent treaty was the START Treaty, the Strategic uh, Arms Limitation Treaty, and that will expire in February of 2021. Our concern is that it won't be renewed. It, it can easily be renewed, and Russia has asked for it to be uh, renewed uh, for another five years, so it should give us a chance to uh, look at this issue a little bit more. Um, there is also, uh, it's rather quiet, and you don't hear much about it in the news, is the um, United Nations has a prohibition against nuclear weapons. And that was started in 2017. Uh, and it'll become a violation of international law um, if we get 50 countries to sign on that. And so far, I, I don't remember what the exact number is. There were 120 original signatories. And I forget how many people or how many countries have ratified. But once 50 countries have ratified that treaty, then those weapons will be outlawed. But the U.S. and um, the other nuclear uh, weapons holding nations have actually um, um, not signed on to that. So this is a concern. You know, there's nobody can win a nuclear war. Ronald Reagan even said that. Um, and you think about that, uh, it would be absolutely devastating, uh, just even a limited war. And you hear them talking about a uh, limited war. Um, uh, what would happen in any nuclear war uh, or any exchange of weapons is they just tend to escalate. So, you know, we firmly believe that they should be abolished. Um, nuclear arsenals across the world, that's a slide that, uh, the next slide that uh, um, Carly has there, um, you know, the U.S. and Russia are the leaders. Um, Israel has anywhere between 80 and 400, according to some of the things I've researched. Um, but any of these used, uh, particularly between any country, but say India and Pakistan, um, would be devastating for the entire planet. Um, one of the issues when we talk about um, homelessness, housing, education, and uh, health care, we spend so much money on these weapons that must never be used. Um, the United States, you, know, you probably not have heard about this, but we plan to spend about uh, 50 to 60 billion dollars a year, nearly 1.7 trillion dollars for these weapons that never should be used. And just think what that money could do if we invested in ourselves and our uh, social good. Uh, Martin Luther King had said uh, um, that a nation that continues to invest year after year in weapons of defense rather than in programs of social uplift um, is approaching spiritual doom. Uh, you know, we have to be crazy to put as much money as we continue to put in our program. Uh, when you look at the discretionary budget and how much we spend on military defense, across the world we have more than 800 bases. I think the number is up closer to 1,000 bases worldwide. And we have to ask ourselves, and what, what good is this? In, in the War on Terror, we've spent um, $6.4 trillion so far. And we plan to spend more for um, you know, maintaining that. So, you know, when you hear in the budget that we are spending one of the largest military budgets for the United States, $738 billion, that's only part of it. They've actually partial, uh, you know, broken this down. So we're actually spending more because that $738 billion does not include uh, the amount of money that we're spending uh, for the VA the care of our soldiers from previous wars. 
It doesn't talk about the retirement program of all our military veterans. But it also doesn't include the Defense uh, Department money that's spent to uh, clean up Hanford or to develop new weapons. And those are carried in other budgets. Looking at the slide, that, uh, the pie chart slide that uh, Carly has there, you'll see that um, uh, you know, it says the budget, you know, the military is $727 billion. Right next to that is veterans benefits. That's another 7% that needs to be added to that. You look at energy and environment, that's another 2%. So it's kind of like um, deceiving the whole public on how much money we're actually spending. A uh, number of sources I've looked at say we're close to $1.2 trillion, um, just on military. So we need to reevaluate that. And that's one of the things WSPR is working on is educating people. Um, you know, maybe we can use uh, some of that uh, business experience to explain to our fellow citizens um, what is their money is going to. Um, Finally, I'd like to say that, you know, WPSR has been working as close as we can with all of our congressional representative with Adam Smith. Um, he's uh, sponsored a bill in the Congress for no first use. That's just a step in the right direction. Um, we're trying to work with the other Congress, uh, congressional uh, people, uh, you know, from Patty Murray's office to Senator Campbell's to have them get on board and start talking about this. Uh, if you've watched the presidential debates, this has not been the topic, and yet it's one that affects us every day. We spend more and more on weapons and less and less on education, healthcare, housing, uh, environmental cleanup. Those are things that we need to put uh, invest into. Anyway, thanks, Carly. Thank you, Kit. Um, the slide that's up now addresses what if military budgets were spent on healthcare? So here we find ourselves in the middle of a global pandemic, the likes of which few of us have ever seen or imagined we would, we would live through. Um, and I think this, this graphic really shows some of the absurdity of how much we're spending um, just for more destruction. Like Maru said before, um, you know, this is one of the only departments um, one of the only budget categories that aside from ICE and Homeland Security that is only intended for killing and destruction. Um, so, you know, this, this compares how many fully equipped ambulances could we produce for one Virginia class nuclear submarine? Um, how many doctors, how many ICU beds for a fighter jet, how many masks for a Trident to nuclear missile? Um, how many ventilators for a tank? Really, so it's, it's a, people say the budget is a moral document. Um, and I think this really does show the immorality that we've talked about. Um, so going beyond the national and global situation, we wanna zoom it into Washington state. Um, let me just spotlight my video. Yeah, so um, if we even consider the story of nuclear weapons in Washington state, um, you can see basically every kind of oppression represented um, through the, the life cycle of nuclear weapons. Um, from start to finish, different communities in Washington, um, which we'll go into detail about, experience environmental degradation, abandonment, lack of cleanup, um, wasted lives, contamination, and health, health crises, no matter where these weapons um, may, may, may touch. So I want to tell a couple of these stories um, and we're going to do some interactive things as well to share our questions and reactions. So while I'm talking, please think about what are your reactions to this information? How does this impact our communities today? Why is this not a larger topic of discussion? Um, please feel free to type those into the chat as we go along. Um, right, so I, I want to appreciate Paul um, for opening us up with um, so much indigenous wisdom um, to talk about what, where we've gone wrong and what colonization has done to all of us. Um, so I'd like to also start by grounding this topic in Spokane, Washington, um, on the land of the Spokane tribe, um, where one of um, the uranium mines was built on their ancestral land in 1955. It's called the Midnight Mine, uh, and it represents um, basically an ecological 
uh, tragedy. Um, so this is a picture in the background of an open pit mine. And the picture at the top um, is a leader, um, uh, Deb Abrahamson Swan, who has been fighting this uh, abuse of her community for, for many decades. Um, and her daughter has taken up that work as well um, through their organization, Shawl Society. So we really need to look toward indigenous leadership um, for the sites that, that need our attention in, in, this, in this issue as well. Um, but to speak on the Midnight Mine, it operated from 1955 to 1965, and again from 68 to 81. And this mine provided uranium for the production of nuclear weapons um, and only became listed as a cleanup site in the year 2000. But the cleanup of the site didn't begin until 2017, 36 years after the mine closed. So this represents um, 36 years of the United States government allowing waste to pollute the area and pollute the surrounding community. Um, people there are concerned about the quality of their water. Um, many people have rates, high rates of cancer um, and they have not yet sought justice. And the, the cleaning company, the new Mott Mining Company that's come in to clean up the Midnight Mine, quote unquote, clean up, um, is also cutting regulations um, and a dangerous actor. Uh, so this really does need our attention. Um, but I want us to know that when we talk about nuclear weapons, we're talking about um, weapons that are created on the basis of colonization, of stolen land and resources, um, and to bully other countries, to allow the United States to continue to steal their land and resources and labor. Um, moving on from the Midnight Mine, We'll talk about, sorry. So this is extraction, right? This is taking uranium out of the ground. Then what happens? Next, uranium has to be produced um, through a complex chemical process into plutonium. And where does that happen in Washington state? Hanford, Washington. So Hanford um, is a former nuclear weapon site in the Tri-Cities. And here you can see a picture of the site, a picture of the workers. And the, the water that you can see in the background is the Columbia River, which is a key ecological resource. Um, the water, like Paul was saying, is sacred to many people. Um, and this is a site where they decided to place a plutonium production facility. Um, so the DOE, the, the Department of Defense, were looking for what they called, quote unquote, an isolated wasteland that could be used indiscriminately for national defense. And so this is where they decided to place the B reactor, which is the first full scale plutonium production reactor in the world, which is responsible for producing plutonium for bombs dropped in Nagasaki um, in, in 1945. And today we're grieving the 75th anniversary of that nuclear attack. The first nuclear bomb dropped along with Hiroshima. And these, this weapon, uh, this plutonium was also used for the first tests in New Mexico. Um, so downwinders is a term that people who are populations affected by radioactive fallout um, near nuclear sites have, have given themselves um, to name the impact that they've had. And downwinders are also entitled, entitled to um, compensation for their exposure to radioactivity. Um, or into radiation. Um, but many, many downwinder communities across the United States and across the world have not yet received this compensation because the United States draws these very strict limitations and requires you to prove that you were in a certain place on a certain day. Um, so it makes a very bureaucratic excuse for not paying back the communities that it has harmed by creating these weapons. Um, not to mention workers who worked at the site um, under a high level of surveillance and scrutiny, um, who were also exposed to these dangerous um, radioactive elements. Um, and that doesn't even mention the waste problem. Um, waste at Hanford is stored in 177 underground tanks, 67 of which have leaked over 1 million gallons of waste into the surrounding soil and water over the years. Um, there's many cases of workers with 
plutonium, which lodges in the body and will continue to emit radiation for the rest of their lives. Um, and of course, again, to ground that this was built on the land of several indigenous tribes, um, including the Yakima Nation, the Confederated Tribes of the Colville, Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Reservation, and the Nez Perce. Um, they were all displaced and given no compensation. Um, and this, uh, this site has contaminated um, many fishing sites, um, many farming sites uh, for the communities around the, what is called the Tri-Cities. Um, the president currently proposes to cut money from this budget, the cleanup budget, in order to build more nuclear weapons. Um, they started a cleanup in uh, 1986 and they said it was a 30 year program. So mm -hmm. that was 30 years ago. And the most recent estimates are that it plans to go on for another 75 years. Exactly. Imagine. And one of the things the present administration, and this would probably apply to any administration, is they want to take the high level waste and call them low level waste and then just leave it. And thanks. Um, can folks see the slides here? Okay, I'll keep going, thank you. Um, thank you for adding that kit. Um, so I wanna also continue to move on to the, um, the communities that have been impacted that I mentioned at the beginning of this story um, in the process of nuclear weapons testing. Um, and this is a story everybody should know, and it's a story that is seldom told, um, even in our nuclear advocacy spaces. Uh, and that's something that, that needs to be corrected. Um, and this is something I never learned in school, right? Kind of like, um, like I never learned about the presence of nuclear weapons 20 miles from where I grew up. Um, I never learned who was impacted beyond the people in Japan. Um, but the, the Marshallese community um, suffered 67 nuclear weapons tests, suffered relocation from their homeland um, to other islands and were abandoned on different islands as internal, internally displaced refugees in military encampments um, and still face the presence of nuclear waste in a dome um, uh, where, where the nuclear waste has just been stored um, which is being impacted by the rising sea levels of, due to climate change. Um, so this is a humanitarian crisis. This is a human rights crisis um, that, that needs to be addressed. Um, and the Marshallese have been fierce advocates for their own, um, their own form of, of nuclear justice. Um, they have spoken in front of the United Nations. They have passed healthcare bills to gain access to healthcare in the United States under the Compact of Free Association. Um, which is the status that the Marshall Islands holds in relationship to the United States. Um, and have even, um, you know, brought their culture and their songs and their form of advocacy uh, to Congress to fight for their own um, health and survival. Um, so many thousands of Marshallese now live in the United States, um, live and work here, but do not receive access to any federal benefits. Um, so during the COVID crisis, um, People are very afraid because they still carry the health impacts of being exposed through generations to nuclear weapons, including high rates of thyroid cancer, um, blood cancers, um, high rates of diabetes, um, and other health impacts um, because the, the nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands also destroyed their sources of food and drastically um, altered their, their culture and, and, and was an act of, of huge destruction. Um, there's about 2,400 2, to 3,000 Marshallese folks that live in Washington state, um, mostly around Everett, Auburn, and Spokane. Um, and now these communities are also faced with issues of um, heavy policing. There was a Marshallese young person who was killed by Spokane police uh, earlier last year um, and issues of, of um, the health crisis here. Um, just yesterday, um, a Marshallese elder passed away in Iowa. Um, and had no access to healthcare in the process. Um, so I think there's, there's really um, a lot we can do to support, um, give funds to, to these organizations and lift up the, the story that they have to tell as some of the fiercest advocates for nuclear abolition. Um, 
And then I want to bring us to another thing that I think we, we all know a lot more about, but I was never taught in school, which is that um, here in Seattle, where I'm speaking from, I'm 20 miles away as the crow flies from the largest concentration of nuclear weapons in the Western Hemisphere. Um, nearly a quarter of America's 9,962 nuclear weapons are assigned to a submarine base called Banger on the Hood Canal. Um, and so this makes our entire region a military target. So we're basically being, you know, put on the front lines of this arms race with Russia and China um, and this inter-imperialist competition for control over the world. Um, and we never got a say in that matter. In fact, there was vibrant protest and resistance um, throughout the, the decades, um, blockades of trains bringing out the missiles, um, protests on the water to prevent these nuclear submarines from being brought in, blockages of um, shipments, uh, mass protests across the country, um, yet the military industrial complex pushed on, established the base um, and uh, is, you know, uh, kind of a sitting duck um, uh, where the submarines port uh, here. And there's, there's, other, there's other nuclear sites, including an Air Force base and um, a research base in Washington that I didn't have time to go into. Um, but I also want to point out, um, I, would, um, I don't want to forget to mention um, that this is also a hub of defense and arms manufacturing. Um, so while many of us have mixed feelings about Boeing, the fact is it's the world's second largest defense manufacturer. Um, and there are different types of weapons made here um, and also headquartered in other parts of the country um, where, where drones are produced to, to spy on Palestinians and Filipinos who are fighting for their liberation. Um, there are fuelers made in Everett, which are supporting the Saudi, the US backed Saudi war on Yemen, um, where there's one of the world's largest and most devastating famines um, and other types of weapons that this corporation makes. Um, meanwhile, it exploits its own workers who are now being forced to go back to the factory floors to make more planes that nobody's gonna get on because we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, but they care more about their bottom line than they do about the safety of even their own workers. Um, so this is really a bad actor and there's a campaign that's listed here in the corner called the Resist US-Led War Movement um, with a campaign locally called Who is Boeing Bombing um, that I'd like to lift up as well that's being led in this community. Um, and I'll start to wrap us up, but um, we, you know, we really do have a history of, of um, fierce and mass activism and protest of these weapons in our region. Um, and those are stories that we should learn. Um, we should learn about the, the native resistance to the, the midnight mine, um, Marshallese resistance, to testing in their islands and also downwinders who have been fighting for their lives um, for decades. Uh, and um, want to invite you to also comment in the chat, why is it important to discuss nuclear weapons through this lens today? This lens of social justice, racial justice, economic justice. Um, and a lot of us will say that everyone is impacted by the, the psychosis of these weapons um, and the American exceptionalism that backs them up. Uh, so th these are things that have been more visible in the past, but right now we're fighting to reactivate and um, re-enliven the movement against nuclear weapons as a tool of imperialist control. Um, and as a, a health organization, WPSR argues that it is um, a physician's, um, and most of our members are doctors, although I'm not, and Kit is not, um, you know, it's, a, it's an argument that it is our social responsibility to prevent what we cannot cure and that we could never cure the impacts of a nuclear attack. Um, we're on the 75th anniversary of the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki this year and survivors or Hibakusha will tell you they never want this to happen again. Um, so there's a lot of ways we can participate um, and we would love for you to be part of it. Um, please go to our websites to, to find out about our current campaigns, um, to support our work. Um, and if your organization is not yet 
a member of our coalition, um, would love to follow up with you. My email address is there um, about the work that we do um, and how you can support. Um, so I can pause there and open for any questions. And I apologize for dumping a lot of heavy information. I think there's a lot of important room for the grief and fear and exhaustion or avoidance that comes from facing such a heavy and terrifying topic. Um, and I think we all work through that in our own ways, but do want to invite space for grief on all of these, all of these issues um, and for the lives lost and the people harmed um, in these stories and in this history. So thank you. Thank you, Kylie, Kit. There are some uh, questions, I see. One is, and you may have already referenced this, I don't know, uh, or have talked about this. Uh, he said, Kit or Kylie, please post reference to the 2017 US prohibition against nuclear weapons. Okay, that'd be good. Yeah. Yeah, the International Coalition to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN. Um, puts out a really a lot of great information about the treaty, um, but it is a treaty that the United States and other nuclear arms nations have not yet ratified. Um, so everyone should call on their senators and their representatives um, to encourage to urge them to ratify this treaty. Um, and to um, there's other kind of intermediate steps as well, like Kit was mentioning. Um, to make sure that the New START Treaty is renewed next year, is extended, um, and to, to prevent the production of these new weapons um, that Kit was talking about that they want to include funding for in next year's budget to the tune of $49, trillion, or $49 billion. Sorry. Yeah, the official name is called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And uh, it was signed uh, or passed at the UN in July 2017. And Carla, I don't know if we have any information that on our website, do we? Yes, we, we should on the coalition page. Okay, the WANW. Okay. Thank you, thank you. There's another one here. Is there, is there a plan to transition from the military industrial complex to other priorities The people involved need to be assisted making the transition. The companies involved need to be repurposed. As with the Green New Deal, there needs to be a plan and people responsible for managing the process. I'm not aware of any formal plan, but that's exactly right. That's what we need to do. I was at a conference where Ralph Nader pointed out, uh, take the, new, uh, the um, New York subway. They put out a, uh, contract or a proposal to have uh, companies bid on rebuilding uh, the New York subway system. It was a $3 billion contract. Not a single U.S. company bid on that. And, you know, I often think that if uh, Boeing was instead of building intercontinental ballistic missiles, they could build subway cars and transportation, high-speed rail. Um, but we do need to look at making that transition. There, there are things that we could definitely do, yes. Yeah, and um, to build off of that answer, um, two other military contractors just won major contracts um, during the COVID pandemic um, or right before it. Um, so Northrop Grumman won the contract for billions of dollars to build new intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, and the argument that the military makes there is that they're going to build a new generation of weapons that are only supposed to be used for deterrence to prevent a nuclear war, and that they're supposed to deter attacks in urban centers on the coasts, and instead draw a nuclear attack to silos where these ICBMs are stationed in Wyoming, uh, North Dakota, and Nebraska, where there are fewer people living. Um, so it's a crazy idea, they should never be built, um, and this company shouldn't be profiting off of mass death. Um, and then another missile, long-range standoff missiles are being produced. Um, and the company Raytheon, um, headquartered uh, in Virginia, um, with a lot of production in California and across the country, just won this billion-dollar contract for another kind of, of death machine. Um, so these are things that we should be informing our communities about. Um, and there should be a vibrant, militant, anti-war movement uh, again 
um, that makes these demands front and center with, you know, with youth and oppressed communities at the center and at the front um, of, of this fight. So yeah, that's, that's the, the mission that we have in front of us. One of the things I'll add on the anti-missile missiles, they're very ineffective. In fact, when they perform tests, these are, the idea is that if any oncoming missiles will um, attack us, that we'll be able to defend against those. But it's just totally a falsehood. It just doesn't work. Even when they have a staged test, they only pass, you know, they know the other missiles being launched. They know where it's going. It only um, makes connection 50% of the time. And that's when they know it's coming. So this is a total, you know, boondoggle. Very bad investment. <laughs> Okay, we've reached the end of the time for this workshop, and there's some other question, a few other questions, and I, I'm going to do my best to uh, to start. I think rather than, uh, I think we'll just go right from the beginning of workshop, and uh, and then proceed and see how many how many qu these questions because they're important. Their audience participation, attendee participation. I want to uh, see what we can do here as far as. Uh, answering them and uh, let me see here I can start I know Paul in his initial presentation uh, there's one uh, Paul are you around still I don't know if he is um, maybe not yeah. maybe. sorry I had him on mute Oh yeah, I'm here. Paul, you here? Oh yeah. Oh great, okay. Uh, you, there's a question, uh, can you recommend a book about indigenous governors, elders, gender roles, et cetera? Yeah, um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, um, you know, the it, I haven't seen one. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, subject matter because of the way that um, this government was formed in the United States. They, the so-called Puritans, I don't think they were all that pure, um, came here and observed uh, Iroquois Confederacy and um, they observed the triad and they observed, um, you know, how the satellites, which were all other tribes in the, in the three in the middle, uh, three aspects in the middle. And one of the aspects was uh, a council of elder women. So, um, uh, and and they, the white male patriarchy couldn't do that. They put in uh, staunchy old white men, and uh, and that's how we got to looking at the end of clean water and in a world that uh, possibly doesn't have a future for our children, and, uh, and a collapsing climate. Uh, if if uh, indigenous hearted, uh, wisdom keeping elder women had the last voice, as they had observed, but were unable to model their democracy after, uh, we would be in a whole different place. We would be in, in more of a place like we had, which was paradise and uh, in peace with all living beings and, uh, and even the water, to have peace with the water, you know, and, uh, and, and all natural beings. So um, yeah, you know, it's a subject matter that, that's dear to me but um, I, 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 sorry, I can't uh, give a reference to a book. Uh, uh, my, my books are elders, and uh, they're, they're books with hearts and spirits and, and, and eyes and, and a mouth and, and, and a way of presenting that touches your soul. So th those are our, our books. Um, uh, we never, that's why we didn't have a written language, so that there would be no loss of, the connection to each other's spirit and the personalness of, of sharing spirit. Sure, books have their place now uh, and they, they can help people, but, um, but find, finding an elder, there's no replacement for having an elder. So uh, I apologize, I don't know what book that would be, <laughs> but, uh, but that's my recommendation to, to, to find elders and sit with them, you know. Indigenous hearted uh, people who have uh, had teachings put in their heart. Um, but um, uh, yeah, uh, I guess other things people could do um, <clears throat> to stop LNG and, 
and those things. Uh, I know that um, uh, oh, there's a um, lot of uh, organizations that are have come together, and uh, there's a lawsuit that will in, uh, will ensue around October, and uh, and you can go to uh, uh, you know against Puget Sound Energy, and uh, to do with the uh, ruling of the permit by Puget Sound Clear Air Agency, who is supposed to use the, you know, 15 to 20 year old uh, science, uh, somewhere around 15 year old uh, science to um, uh, determine whether the particulate matter from the Tacoma LNG plant would, uh, would, would it harm uh, our climate. And, and, and also is, is uh, you know, the, the current science knows it's as dirty as coal. So um, we need to use current science. And that, that's why I, I think that's probably one of the basis is for the lawsuit, I would presume. But um, you can go to Native Daily Network on Facebook. They probably have a page also, NDN, Native Daily Network. Uh, you can go to their uh, page. Uh, you can go to uh, PL Water Warriors Facebook page. Uh, you can go to Protectors of the Sale Sea Facebook page, like those, and stay tuned. Uh, um, yeah, there, we. Uh, I know that uh, they are still planning actions, um, uh, kind of long term because of COVID. Um, uh, there's still a lot going on around that, and uh, 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 if there's a time to stop uh, frac gas plants right now, such as Tacoma LNG, eight million gallon frac gas bomb with a 13 mile blast zone melts metal at one mile, sitting uh, at right where the Puyallup live, uh, less than a mile they live from. And, uh, and now is the time that, that fracking uh, plants are closing down and oil dropped to zero about a week or so ago and uh, bounced back to, you know, in the, around 20 something bucks a barrel. So um, uh, the other thing is Kalama uh, methanol in Washington state, uh, the proposed largest methanol plant in the whole world and, uh, and, and we need to stop that, so, uh, yeah. Thank you. Kwabi, I think you got one here that, uh, there's others, I'm sorry, we're just not gonna be able to get to all of them. I'm just doing, I'm trying to do that justice to all of you guys and to all the attendees and get through a good bulk of them, it's kind of random here, but one of them, it says, uh, uh, Kwabi, your peace campaign has required trusting a lot of people staying in strangers' homes, giving out your contact information, et cetera. How have you dealt with the possibility of people acting out of bad intentions? Oh, well, <laughs> uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, there hasn't been any ill intention. Um, the number that I've released is a temporary number for the Peace Bus. It's not my personal number. When I go out and deliver to people's homes, there's all, it's nothing but smiling faces. I haven't had someone come, like it's, you know, these people are in need. So I'm supplying yeah. them with the, something that they need, you know. Yeah, so. yeah it makes sense, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Somebody says, either, I think this has to do with nuclear weapons uh, abolition, but are there movies about this? I'm not sure what aspect of it, is, it has to do with this, that whether it's the nuclear weapons prohibition treaty or maybe uh, Spokane or the indigenous lands. Uh, well, there's actually a, two movies. I could, there are several I could, I could bring to everyone's attention. Uh, there's one to learn about the Marshall Island and about our activities of the U.S. in the Marshall Islands and our testing program. There's one called Nuclear Savage. It's a documentary, and it might be available on YouTube, Nuclear Savage. Um, the title's a little bit longer than that, but that's enough to find that. Uh, there's another documentary called the Atomic States of America. And that's a very good one that just tells about um, nuclear weapons, nuclear power. And both of those are documentaries that will uh, increase your knowledge and awareness. And so they're worth sharing. 
Thank you. Um, you know, it's 12.30 and it's right at the time where you said this is uh, going to end and I feel like we just began. Uh, this has been, uh, for me, it's been, uh, um, I mean, I never can get enough of this. You know, it's all, I always learn things, you know, lightning and you folks on the, on the front line, so to speak, of, everyone in your own way has been very uh, uh, informative, illuminative. Uh, and this has been, I think it's uh, been a very positive uh, video. I, I, I hope it's been uh, uh, one for all of you folks in, uh, who have attended this. Um, and uh, I don't know what more to say. I just appreciate all of you guys, the workshop presenters and all of you people who uh, tuned in today and, and asked questions, made comments. Um, thank you very much. Thanks.